Hey there, welcome to Board Game Hot Takes, the podcast where we give our immediate reactions to the hottest board games just minutes after playing them. My name's Tim. And this is Chris. This is Adam. And tonight we're going to give our hot take review on the game we just finished playing, Carnegie. We also will be covering a couple of games that have been on our table this week. Adam will be talking about Envelopes of Cash, and I'll be talking about Slay the Spire, the board game. But before we get into that, we do have some poll results to discuss. As always, every week I ask a poll on Twitter. And this week, the poll question was, where do you most commonly learn about new board games? And the results I got back were podcast or YouTube channel, 58%. Social media posts or ads, 18.3%. Board Game Geek, 16%. And friends or at our local game store, 7.7%. So it seems like the majority of people that responded on the poll get it from podcasts or YouTube channels, but it is kind of a selective audience. It's a lot of it are people that follow us on Twitter. So obviously they're podcast listeners, but how'd you guys answer this? Well, actually it's you guys for me. So I think that covers at least two of the categories, podcasters and friends. And I probably fit a third, what was the third one and fourth one? Board game geek or social media post. Okay. Well, I learned them from on social media posts from you guys. So, so there you go. I basically all of the above. <laughs> yeah, I was the same. I think um, a, a smattering of all of these was what I put. I think I put the podcasters or whatever the first one was, whatever had the majority, the same as everybody else. But yeah, I hear about games from you guys. I hear about games from podcasters. Sometimes I'll see an ad on board game geek and I'll click it. And sometimes I'll just go to Kickstarter and snoop around and see what's out there. There's a guy who puts out a thread on Reddit, among other places, that has upcoming crowdfunded games. And sometimes I'll look at that and see which ones have the most backers. And I'll say, oh, that sounds interesting. I'll go click around, check it out. So those are my main sources. What about you, Tim? Well, first, I want to point out that I specifically put in all caps, most commonly learn about new board games. Because I knew I was going to get a lot of people that were like, I learn about them from all kinds of places. And that's exactly how you guys answered. So thanks for not following the rules. So it's our fault. It's our fault this time. It's not, <laughs> you did an excellent poll. It's Chris's and my fault. It's funny. We're questioning the um, the poll and that never happens. Not not in the United States. Not on election oh. day. Here which is while we're recording. Well, well, let's not go down that dark path. The way I answered this, I said Board Game Geek. Now, I probably hear about most new games from podcasts, to be honest, because I, I spend a lot of time listening to board game podcasts. But I think I generally, most of them don't catch my attention a lot if it's the first time I'm hearing about it. So I really get to know games and, and I think I really learn about them. Usually just by looking at the hotness, you know, every I'll go on Board Game Geek once or twice a day see what's on the hotness, see what people are talking about in threads and probably get hit with some ads as well. So I think I probably learned about the most new stuff there. The games I get most excited about now that I'm thinking of it are the games that you guys talk about that I've never heard of yet. So I think Chris has mentioned like Donut drive through And what's one of those Kickstarters, Chris, that hasn't delivered with the, oh, the-, the buildings that have like that thin, horrific world built kind of art? Oh, the uh, Madness something with madness is that the one it's good podcasting here why am i, <laughs> I think so. why am i not remembering it <laughs> no seriously i should know it by now there is the um the dim sum one that's not the one you're thinking of the dim sum one yeah so the ones that you guys bring up that i haven't heard about i'm like oh what because uh, you know you, you guys bring interesting stuff to the table so those are the ones i I get most excited about. You know, I actually, I'm going to go back and revise my my answer one more time. We've actually gotten some really good recommendations from some of our listeners. And I think some of the most, you know, the surprising ones I think have actually been from listeners too. So I really appreciate what they bring to the table. Bring to the table. See how I did that? Ah. <laughs> it does always crack me up how much more educated our listeners are about board games than we are. Like, I know, seriously. Be like, yeah, I just played that for the first time. They're like, oh, yeah, I played it like 28 times. What do you think of this strategy? <laughs> I'm like, oh, geez. Why are they even listening to me? All right, well, cool. So that's uh, how we find out about <laughs> games, I guess. Uh, we did get a bunch of answers on the Twitter feed as well. So I don't have time to read those tonight, but generally we do read a lot of those on the show as well. So if you're interested in hearing how some other people responded and some specifics they gave, go out and check out our Twitter feed and uh, you can read those. Come and join us there and you can answer along as well. You can find us at BG underscore hot takes. So why don't we jump into a description of Carnegie? Carnegie is a worker placement game in which one to four players do various commercial and philanthropic things, it's quite a mishmash, inspired ever so loosely by the life and times of the famous 19th century industrialist Andrew Carnegie. Each player is a company trying to spread their influence, make a lot of money, and build the most impressive business empire. 
The game takes place over the course of 20 rounds with the action split between a shared central board with a map of the United States, individual player boards with offices, departments, and workers, and a timeline board used to select actions and set the course of each round. At the start of each round, the active player will select a space on the timeline board that will dictate what each player will be allowed to do during that round. This will generally involve a decision between taking income in some geographic location on the map or making philanthropic donations that will be a major source of scoring at the end of the game. Each timeline selection will also trigger a particular type of department within the player's companies. And there are four of these. The Human Resources Department that allows players to move their workers around and reallocate their, oh, well, human resources. The Construction Department lets players put new projects out on the main map board. The Management Department lets players gain resources and money. And the Research and Development Department lets players, you guessed it, research and develop new technologies and projects. Players will spend 20 rounds building, researching, allocating resources, and making donations. And at the end, the score will be tallied and the player with the most points wins the game. Carnegie was designed by Javier George and is published by, I have no idea how to pronounce this, so it's Quined or Quind or Quind Games. Apologies on that one. Thanks for the description, Chris. All right, we're going to start by talking about the gameplay mechanisms of Carnegie. And uh, just for a little reference, this was all three of ours first play tonight. We played on Board Game Arena, but we did get a good chance to uh, see all of the beautiful art and production uh, that Ian O'Toole brought to this uh, this game. So it was a interesting first game, and I'm going to jump in with some mechanisms. I do think this was a little bit on the heavier side than we usually tend to play and talk about on, on a first play. So keep that in mind. But there is a lot of things that, that I really liked. The, the first I'll talk about, though, is the donations. I think what is really cool about that track is that or that kind of that process that mechanism in this game is that it drives basically independent or individual scoring goals you pick them at different points in the game the first one you pick is going to be the cheapest so there's the least at stake there maybe you're thinking hey i really feel like i'm going to build up a big presence in the midwest at this point so i'll pick that one you know the one that gives me extra points for doing that no one else can take it but then as you get a little bit further in the game you get a chance to pick another one but it costs twice as much money but you'll have a little bit more information. So it's a really clever, you know, like kind of growth about what you know and what you're going to be able to focus on. And it drives your strategy, but allows you to pivot and, and find other opportunities for points. So I thought that donation track, aside from being really cool thematically, I thought it was really uh, a really neat mechanism to, to drive some positions. Yeah, I like that part of the game, too. And one of the things that I liked about it was that they're all laid out there right at the beginning of the game. They're all clear. Each spot can be taken one time. So there's fighting over the over those spots, and, and that creates some interesting player interaction. One thing I want to talk about is the action selection, because there's a lot of stuff happening when you make an action selection here, and it honestly got a little bit confusing to me as I was going through this. I was making all kinds of mistakes. I was screwing things up and forgetting this, that, and the other thing. And the first thing that your action selection choice makes happen is, is this going to be a turn where we're doing something in a particular geographic region? Or is this something where we are uh, making donations? And at the same time, you're picking which type of department within your company is going to be activated. And all of that stuff matters because the region is going to decide what kind of income is going to be triggered. And that's huge because income is what's going to obviously make it so that you can do all the other things that you want to do. The donations, of course are the alternative to income, and the donations let you spend some of that money to pick these spots that Tim was just talking about. And then kind of the real meat and potatoes of that is that this dictates the track or the department that each player is going to have to operate in for the rest of that turn. And that could be all those things like building, moving employees around. And so I found it very easy as I was going through the, the turn selection to forget one piece or how one piece interacted with another piece. And it wasn't bad enough that I'd say it was incredibly frustrating, but it was definitely a bit of a brain burn. And I found like I was making a lot of mistakes. Probably a few plays might fix that, but whew, it was something. Yeah, you guys mentioned it, Tim. You said this is heavier than we usually go. And Chris, you said it too. There's a lot going on, even with just that initial action selection phase at the beginning of each round. I want to talk about these transportation income tracks for each region. You start out on the leftmost side and it's just like a horse and buggy. Then you upgrade to the Wells Fargo looking, uh, there's two horses or maybe it's four horses dragging along this thing with 
some gold, you know, like a billy, the kid's going to come rob this thing. That's what you're thinking of there. And then the, uh, and then you can upgrade to a train, a locomotive once you get further enough to the right. And so the amount of workers, employees that you send to that region, they get stuck in this little circle on the far right. And when you trigger the income, they come back to you and you get the, there's a lot going on here and that's just the income phase. So that a lot of the stuff I'm having trouble wrapping my head around, this is just the first play from a weight standpoint. It's tricky. It's a lot trickier than what I'm used to. And I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. I don't know to make some sense of that income track for me and how that ties in with these workers going out on quests, missions, projects. What are those? Help us, Tim. Help us. <laughs> well, yeah. The, so the income was cool, but I want to, and I'm going to tie it into what Chris was talking about with this action selection mechanism. And what he said is you got to make all these decisions for what you're going to do, what you're going to activate in your department. But what's really interesting about that is you're actually making a decision for what everybody's going to activate when you take your, your turn both whether they're going to do an income in a certain region or a donation, and then what department they're going to activate in. And why that's so interesting is that it takes a certain amount of effort to actually get workers to a place where you can get income in a region or to have enough money to get a donation or to have the right workers in a department. And so what that leads to is you can make a decision to say, well, this could help me, but if I take this other action, I'm the only one that can trigger it this turn. Or if two, you know, only two of us are going to trigger it, I'm going to block Chris and Adam out from even getting an action this round. And that's a really fun source of interaction. It makes you have to be really careful about what do you leave yourself set up with on your previous action? You know, do you move all your workers or do you put them all out on the board in this one space or do you leave one or two out there in a, in a department so that they can be reused again? And But that does tie into the income that Adam was talking about. The income is one of the things that you can trigger. And this reminded me a lot of the, um, the Ankh action selection mechanism where it's kind of a shared track that everyone's moving up. Now, in Ankh, you don't all do the same action on that turn, but it does make some of the same choices of like, well, if I move this one, then someone else is going to activate this other one. So I can kind of set myself up to do both of those in a row, or I can take this one that's most valuable, but then someone else might do this one and I'm not going to get any benefit from it. So fun choices there. Uh, the income part though, is like you would have to send your your workers from a certain department out or some, from different departments out on quests out to these regions of the board. And uh, if their workers are out there and then an income triggers, you get to activate the income of where your transportation track is, but also all of the building projects you've done on the side of your player board at the same time. So it's important to kind of think about like who's going to activate in which region next, because if I get a guy out there, then I can trigger all these incomes. If I don't have someone there, I don't trigger any of them. You know, that's what the income is doing. But it it's it is it's pretty. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of stuff tied together here in an interesting way. One of the things I would say about that transportation track is that I felt the, the income choices were cool, right? Because you could move up this track and kind of get different benefits when income triggered. But at certain points, you hit a threshold, which would raise your transportation level. And that's where Adam was talking about, like the buggy to the, you know, the horses to the buggy to the train. The problem with that for me was that moving up that track and getting building trains was really just, it, it turned into a score multiplier at the end. So the highest level of transportation you had for all your connecting points, it didn't, it didn't feel like it actually did, did anything thematic in the game itself. Um, so that was a little bit of a letdown, but uh, you know, minor quibble on that piece. Otherwise it took a little while to get my head wrapped around it as well. But by the end I was like, okay, this is really cool. Like this income does a lot of different things and I got to make choices during the game about how I'm set myself up for income and in which region. I found it to be fun once I once I understood what was going on there. The income was really satisfying in this game. There's all these different spaces that you can go to pulling tokens off and opening things up that let you gain income. I actually really liked that. I thought there was a lot of cool stuff happening and it really lets you make some interesting decisions about what you wanted your income to look like. But that track with the transportation, I don't know what the hell was going on with that. Thing. <laughs> what did that have to do with transportation? It actually reminded me a lot of the train yeah. in... Uh, what's that? What's the one with the train that doesn't really do anything? The cowboy one. Come on, guys, help me with this. The Great Western Trail. Yeah, oh, Great, Great Western, Western Trail, Trail, where it's like, what does the train have to do with anything? It's like yeah. going to New York, but there's no cows on it. I, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> but this is kind of like that. You have that each region has a transportation track, but all that is is income and scoring. It doesn't actually have anything to do with your ability to move things. It, you're not even moving things between cities. All you're trying to do is basically create routes between the cities and use them as opportunities to put these tokens out. Which brings me to the main, the main board, the main shared board, which is the map of the United States. And one of the things that I actually found a little bit strange about that was that the board is almost optional. 
Like you could really kind of ignore putting things out on that map if you wanted to. There are other ways you can score. You could do a whole lot of other things like making donations. And so you don't even really have to get into that if you choose not to. So I'm not sure how I feel about that because it is this big board. It's got this nice art on it. You really want to do something with it. You want to put things out there and build routes and all that. But it's not even necessarily the best path to victory. And I'm, like I said, I'm not quite sure what to make of that. The uh, the transportation tracks for each region, Chris, I think to make sense of that, the best I could come up with was that kind of represents your infrastructure in each region. So as you get better infrastructure there, yeah, you're going to make a little more income, a little more pointage and and uh, set your company up a little better, which the theme is a little thin here. We'll get into that in a bit. But you guys have been hinting at something, the player interaction. I think it is beefy enough and interesting enough to, to satisfy me. You make some good points, Tim. You're going to be looking over at other players' money and other players' cubes. And, oh, if I do the uh, the construction action right now, Chris doesn't have any worker. I mean, more often than not, this game, Adam doesn't have any employees in his construction offices. They're out to lunch. I'm going to be able to build stuff. Everybody's going to be able to build stuff except for Adam here. Um, so you really have to keep track of what other players um, have as far as their employee location within their offices and where those are going out and how much resources that. So I do like the interaction here. That's some nice heft on that. Yeah. And one of the other things I, I liked, we, you know, hinted at with the interaction was how you could have workers in your, in your office spaces or you couldn't, but cool thing is you could build new office spaces here. So I was thinking about like that building action or whatever it was, the one that actually lets you put new buildings out on the board. What was that called? You just mentioned it. That was like the flow chart one or the... Uh... No, the construction. Oh, construction. That's what yeah. it was. So there's this construction you know, space that you start with where you can put up to three guys out there and that's who you're going to send out the projects and build buildings on the board. Then you could actually build new building. You could build new departments in your building. And that was an interesting variety. Like I built one early that let me get discounts on donations. I built another one that let me get discounts on um, training points when I, when I was moving up that engineering track. And so it gave me a little bit of engine building. But for example, that that uh, construction space, you could build another construction space. So if you didn't feel like you were getting enough infrastructure built out on the board, you could you could add more to it. So I think that's what Chris was hinting at, that you could probably focus, not even look at the, the main board and just focus on that. I don't know if that's true. I think you got to do a little bit of a mix, but I do think this game would allow you to go heavy in one or two directions and focus on those while doing just a little bit in other areas. Because I think if you didn't do anything with the board at all, maybe you don't build a lot of buildings, but you got to put people out there at least if you're ever going to trigger any of your income. Otherwise, I think you're going to run out of money. So I think the main board still had some impact, but I don't know. I thought it was an interesting blend of kind of building up your own engine and then interacting with with the other spaces on the board and where you can put stuff. I didn't feel like the board, the main board was very tight. Like I never felt like I couldn't build in a space I didn't want to. Um, I'm sure that could have probably if we were all more efficient in building more buildings out there, but maybe that would have happened more. But I always felt like I could pretty much move down the route I wanted to and, and put buildings out there when I wanted to. Oh, it happened, Tim. Trust me, it happened. <laughs> now, each time you guys mention something here, I want to say something about it. But then I pause because I'm thinking to myself, whatever that thing is you're talking about, it probably has a half dozen implications. There's like this huge waterfall effect of all these things that happen and each thing does 10 other things. And so... Uh, let me give a couple of examples. So you've got building tokens that go out on building spaces. The building spaces let you create these routes from place to place. The building tokens also open up spaces on your technology track that give you income. And they also serve as a way to indicate various different things for endgame scoring. You've got your little worker tokens. The little worker tokens let you take actions within whatever department they work in, but they also let you get income once they move out onto the board. And they do, again, it's, it feels like each of these different elements does a half dozen different things. And I'm not sure if I think that's really clever or really obnoxious. How did you guys feel about that? I'm of the same mind, Chris. Like, okay, well you've, the designer here figured out how to tie all this stuff together in, in, in some kind of way. Is it an interesting way? Is it, it's, it's very complex kind of a way, that's for sure. And it's integrated. But is it enjoyable or intuitive or, you know, it's puzzly for puzzly's sake, I almost feel like. I don't know. It's It loses some of that streamlinedness, especially without a solid theme there to to bring everything together to make it understandable for me. It loses just a little bit of that. Well, it adds opaqueness and it loses the non opacity, I guess I want to say. So, yeah, it makes it a little tougher to see through 
the game and figure out what's happening and what you're supposed to do. It's a little tough for me. What about you, Tim? I, I would kind of agree with you guys. I think that there's a lot of interconnected mechanisms here, and it reminds me of the most of any designer that I've played before. It reminds me of a, a light Lacerda game. That's what I was going to say too, Tim. Right? Like Vitell Lacerda has got all these interconnected mechanisms. You've got to trigger this one thing to do this other thing. And I can see the link there, but I did find the game to be pretty easy for me to get to grasp after the first couple of rounds. Now I watched a how to play video to start with, and that was a challenge to understand what was going on. And then I read the rule book and that, that got me a little bit closer. And then a turn, you know, a round or two in, I was, things were finally starting to come together for me. So by the end of it, I felt like, you know, the last few rounds, I could take my turn quickly. I kind of understood how the stuff worked. So I think it's just, you know, it's just, again, it's on the heavier end of things that we're playing one time. I mean, we we definitely have played and reviewed some games at this weight, but in most cases, when we're playing something that's this weight, it's something we played a bit more before we 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 touched on it. So this is kind of an early thought for something this heavy, and I think that that that, that can be fun. It can be fun to explore. I'm excited to explore this game more. I think there's a lot that I could I could get out of a second play, but also it's a lot of work to do it. And I, you know, sometimes it's worth it. Sometimes it's not. We can talk about that in our final thoughts. But um, yeah, there's a lot, a lot of things connected here. I wouldn't say that they were connected just for the purpose of being clever. I think, I think it brought, I think there, it made some fun, interesting choices. But I could see it going either way. The one final thing we haven't talked about yet is the little cog pop out things oh, yeah. to the right side of the player board. I still don't know what those do. <laughs> it, can anybody provide some clarity? I, I think it's like an income supplement or some of the action yeah. that supplements your stuff. Yeah. <laughs> what do those do? I don't. Know. That just seemed like another piece that was added. To, you know, I'm not. The, I'm not the quickest guy of the group. I don't think. But that that one has me confounded. Yeah, those were the research tracks. But you're not really researching anything, or if you are, it's not really clear. All you're really doing is adding income and creating new tokens that you can use to put out on the board, and probably three other things that I'm forgetting about. But when I was doing the the rules description, I was kind of reluctant to even say the research track because I don't think anything in there seemed particularly researchy. But maybe, Tim, maybe you have a better grasp on this. Well, I thought they were called project tracks, but the idea being that you are essentially figuring it out over time how to make your your building projects more efficient. And so each one makes it a little bit better that when you put one out, you're going to get more income from that building. Let's say the first cotton mill that you build, right? And you build it out in Philadelphia and it's pretty inefficient. You know, your workers that, you know, they, you haven't trained them well, you don't have the right equipment. So a couple of years later, you build your next cotton mill and it's sitting out here in I don't know, Wyoming. But that cotton mill, that you, now you've got the latest technology you've learned from some of your past mistakes. And that one's going to be running a little bit smoother. The way it's represented with the user experience in the game, that is where the theme falls apart because you just have these weird dial. Like your main player board looks like a like an old fashioned kind of you know factory building or office building. Office building, and so that makes yeah. sense, right? And you're building rooms out there which represent your departments, and you're moving workers from your lobby to your apartments. All that's thematic, and then these these project boards that you slide out come right out of that building. And so for some reason, I think part of the disconnect is that you're your main player board is made to look thematic and then these pieces don't have any thematic link to them. But, you know, I think that's what they're trying to do is to represent that the, each time you build a building, each time you, you research, now you can put a new type of factory out that's going to be a little bit better than, than the last factory. It's going to produce more stuff when you put it out. So that's where I got it, got from it. And I thought it was a cool component too, you know, you just get this little sliding thing that at first you don't care what it, what's behind it, but once you slide it out and there's more opportunities uh, to build those types of buildings out. I, I don't know. I thought it was, I thought it was a cool component. And I, again, I felt by the end of it that it was pretty intuitive, but definitely wasn't intuitive when I started. So, you know, I don't think I realized this until you said it, Tim, but I think that was one of the things that bothered me about those cogs. And I didn't dislike the component. I thought it was actually kind of a cool component, but it was really the only thing in the whole game as best I can recall that didn't look thematic in terms of its art. It was this very kind of functional, not very exciting looking. I mean, a lot of the art in this is very nice. And I know we're starting to stray into production and theme, but, you know, Tool's artwork is absolutely lovely. It's very, what what was the, what's the name of that style? We were talking about it. Art Nouveau? Art Nouveau, yeah. Yeah, this Art Nouveau style that's so in, evocative of the 1800s, I thought was great. And then you have these weird little cogs. It's like a bunch of iconography on it. And I'm like, ah. A bummer. Yeah. So for the production and theme, I'm with you, Chris. I thought the art was gorgeous. I thought the gentle tones are almost pastel y with some beige. It wasn't full Euro y beigey beige. It was 
it was nicely presented. I thought Easter with a little extra. And I thought the board was nicely laid out, had the map of the United States in there with clear regions going on and clear sections and the score tracker going around the outside, tastefully done. I thought it looked beautiful. I just uh, I just didn't know what was going on in the game itself. You said beige and you talked about beige and like the Euro style of beige. This actually reminded me of sepia tone, which seems appropriate for this. I thought that was actually kind of nice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, th- I think that the the production is great here, both the artwork, as you mentioned, but I think the most important thing is the kind of the UI with this one. You know, there's a lot of iconography in it. And Adam, you know, you referenced again, you didn't really know what was going on. And that's probably part of the failing here because a lot of it's represented by iconography. But again, for me, you know, halfway through the game, every icon, every icon made sense. I didn't, you know, like, yeah, we had, we were playing on board game arena. We had some tool tips to reference, but I don't think I needed to anymore at that point. I think, you know, tool did a good job of, of kind of, uh, you know, refining what is this pretty fairly heavy rule set and a lot of different opportunities, a lot of different options going on into something that made a lot of sense, you know, but, it, but, but it's not, you know, it's, it's language independent. It's not telling you on the board what things do. So it still takes some mental effort to process those things, but I think they did a great job here. I really like the production. I'd love to play this in person and, and get a feel for the components. Yeah, I, I can't complain at all. I think for a Euro, which it has a pretty old fashioned Euro style theme, it was one of the more more beautiful uh, games in that genre that I've seen. I got to agree with that. I thought the production was very nice. I was a little bit skeptical at first uh, when I looked at the pictures online. But then when we got into the game itself and started interacting with the board and I started really looking at it in a more thoughtful way, I think the art really did shine. I think it was excellent. And this isn't the type of game that's going to have a whole lot of components and fancy things that you can make. You know, there's no minis or any of that kind of thing, nor does it need it. I don't think this is that kind of game, but for the kind of game that it is, I think that the art and the components do exactly what they're supposed to do. Zero complaints about the art in this game or the production. I will complain a little bit about the theme because for one, it has absolutely nothing to do with Andrew Carnegie. So That's one thing. The other thing is that so many of the pieces don't really feel like they fit in with the theme to me. And there's a couple things that you guys have said that I'm like, oh, yeah, I guess I could sort of see that. But a lot of it was not intuitive, like the transportation track thing that we were talking about. That did not feel intuitive to me because it did not feel thematic. And that's not to say that I found these things unpleasant. I found a lot of these actions and a lot of the different things that these various components of the game did, I found them pleasant. I liked doing them, Uh, but I just didn't feel like it really did a good job of carrying through this pleasant theme. Yeah, I'm with you, Chris. I think the the art is tremendous. I said it already, but a little bit of pushback on the UI, Tim, the user experience and iconography. Yeah, it started clicking for me. I don't know, the last third of the game. I was like, oh, okay, I get it now. But compare it with something like Voidfall, which we did on TTS without the hand holding of Board Game Arena, even with something like Voidfall, where there's tons of iconography, there's even like a whole page of like the explaining the 40 or 50 different icons, something like that clicked a lot sooner for me, a lot easier, more intuitive than the whole, where do I go now? What am I looking at here? What's this mean? How do I do this? What's this symbol mean? Yeah, it started clicking here, but it just didn't come as easily as a lot of other games do. So that's my only slight pushback there. Yeah, I got it, but it took a while. Chris, I want to push back on the theme complaint that you had there because, yeah, you're not playing as Andrew Carnegie, but you're playing as like a peer. You're, you're trying to be Andrew Carnegie, basically, right? You're trying to build, be an industrialist from that era who is you know, making a ton of money and then eventually earning some, uh, some longstanding acclaim by, by donating your money and getting your name all over buildings and institutions and libraries and all of that stuff. I don't know. I think it comes through perfectly fine here. Yeah. Every mechanical thing here is not going to link perfectly to theme, but it makes sense that they put the Carnegie name on the box here. You're, you know, if you're making a competitive game, you can't all be Andrew Carnegie. So that's why, you know, you have to play as somebody else, but it makes perfect sense to me. But there was no actual Andrew Carnegie here. I mean, this would be like calling Star Realms Neil Armstrong. I mean, yes, there is there <laughs> there is a guy that is out there in the world that has some relationship to the general subject matter of the game, sure. But 
I don't, I don't, Adam's not buying it. No, Chris, it was based. It was based on his like life and career about he, you know, like he built up the steel industry and these railroads and these buildings and this infrastructure. And then he donated money. Like, listen, I'm not saying that Andrew Carnegie was the greatest person of all time. All I'm saying is that I, I think that the, the game was built around what they were trying to, you know, they were trying to take his life and his actions and then turn it into a game. And I think they did a great job here. Just, I can't see your argument here. It doesn't make sense to me. Neil Armstrong. <laughs> Tim, I'm going to steal your role and ask, would you request to play this again? I think I already know the answer. I would. Yeah. I, I had a, I had a lot of fun with it and I felt like I made a lot of mistakes and there's, there's a lot of things I could do better and there's a lot to explore here. I, w- I really want to play it again. And again, board game arena makes it easy. I'd love to play this in person because I think that scrolling up and down to look at other people's boards didn't give me a good picture on what I should be doing and what I should be blocking. Um, you know, so it was one of those situations where I think playing this in person and having a full view of the board and, all right, I got to get some guys out to that region because someone else is about to take that. You know, I think this is a, I think this is an excellent Euro game, a little on the heavier side, which I don't mind once in a while. I don't want too many of these. My one complaint in this game, and I don't know if that would continue through on a second one, but there was a lot of downtime between your turns. You know, you would take an action. Um, so let's say I picked an action, right? And then I've got to, I've got to, you know, choose whether I'm doing a production or, or doing a donation. And then I'm going to choose what action I'm going to take. So I do all that stuff. I do my production. I make the decisions there. Then I make the decisions with my action, which is activating several people, putting them out on different spaces. And then I have to wait for all three other players to do the exact same series of things. And there's a lot of decisions to make in there. And so even though it would seem like, hey, there shouldn't be much downtime because everybody's taking an action on each person's turn, but it's not really like that. It's just like one person sets what everybody's turn is going to be that time. And the turns were were quite long. That was my biggest complaint here. You know, this would be great to play async on board game arena because I don't have to sit there and wait for somebody else to do it. But I don't know that it would speed up anymore if you're playing in person. Pro- obviously, with more plays, probably will a little bit. But I think that's my biggest complaint here. D- decent amount of di- downtime between turns, which definitely was getting dull to me by the end of the game. But I did like when it came to my turn, I, I enjoyed the decisions. I enjoyed the decision space to play around in and the, the choices. And I didn't even do particularly well, but I, I'm excited to try it again and uh, see how it goes from there. You mentioned that we were playing it on BGA and about the time lag that you were just talking about. So when somebody else started their turn, like when I finished my turn, I would click over into my other BGA games and I would go through four or five turns in other games and then come back and it would just be getting back to my turn in Carnegie. So, so there's that. As to the question of what I want to play it again, uh, I feel like I need to ease into this answer. So I had a weird relationship with this game from the start. There was something about this that just didn't click for me. I mean, I watched two instructional videos on this and had such a difficult time actually tracking and assimilating the information that we got in at two videos in and we started this and I barely felt like I had a clue of what I was doing. Now, by the middle of the game, I felt like I had a reasonably good idea of what I was doing. And by the end, I feel like I could go in and I could play a competent game next time. But I feel like this is one that is tremendously dependent on the forum. So if we were playing this game on Tabletop Simulator, I think it would have been nearly unplayable. On BGA, I thought it actually was quite nice. And I'm, I actually do want to play it again on BGA. I'm looking forward to trying it again. I thought there was interesting decisions to be made. It may not be my absolute top type of game. It's a little bit more sandboxy. And the combination of the sandboxiness with the multiple functions of seemingly every component of the game kind of kind of rubbed me a little bit the wrong way. But I, I did enjoy it. I would certainly give it another chance. And I think that... I would enjoy it more on a second play. I feel like the second play would be more enjoyable. And then after that, I have this feeling that this one might start going downhill. I've said that before, and I've been surprised about games. So I'll leave that one open. I'm kind of giving this one a kind of thumbs to the side sort sort of a thing. But going back to the format, I think playing this in real life would be a very pleasant experience. That one, honestly, I'd have to do it to really to really get a feel for that. Chris, I'm not trying to one up you, but I have to beat you at something tonight. I watched three videos <laughs> on how to play this game and I could not absorb the information. I I just didn't understand like why do you put your guys here? What's going on with this build? What's this office do? I don't get it. But, you know, playing some of it clicked a little bit. 
I guess it was enjoyable somewhere in there near the end, but not enough to stand out from any other resource management game. This is just, if you like resource management done in a different way, then here you go. A little bit of tableau building, a little bit of this income thing with some nice player interaction, admittedly, and a little bit of route building, some a lot of options for point scoring, like you mentioned, Chris. So a lot of ways to go, but I don't know. This doesn't get me jazzed. I probably will go back and play it two or three more times to see if some kind of fire gets lit underneath me and something gets going. But right now, I am I was more excited coming into this game than I am after playing this game. So that's where I sit with Carnegie. The one thing I want to mention is I think that the reason this probably feels, you know, felt heavier and maybe a little less fun on a first play is that, to be honest, I think some of the, the mechanisms were a little more unique than other games, other Euro style games we've been playing. I mean, Barrage is a great example. It's about the same weight, I think. And I think we all got in and picked that up pretty easy. But it's worker placement. It's like we've done it a billion times. The decisions may be tough, but the, the actions that you're taking are well known. They're well understood. And this one, it just it had some unique actions. You weren't just doing worker placement. You were doing a variety of different things that were all interconnected. So in some ways, I'm really, you know, yeah, it made it a little harder to get into, but I'm actually really excited about it for that reason. Somebody managed to to take some Euro style ideas, but but make them operate in a different way that again, I felt worked really well and was pretty streamlined by the end of the game once i absorbed all the iconography and things like that so i think it's worth you know noting that and thinking about that when comparing it to other similar style you know resource management games but yeah we'll see how how it goes on a couple more plays then i guess uh, we'll have to report back all right well i think that will wrap up our conversation on carnegie we're going to talk about a a couple games that have been on our table and we'll we have a carnegie themed cocktail right after this All right, welcome back, Chris. What do you have for us today? Hey, so Andrew Carnegie probably has his name on more stuff in America than anyone who wasn't a president. Everything from universities to towns to libraries. But, you know, oddly, he also has a really cool yet very ambiguous name. I mean, does anybody really know how to pronounce it? I mean, I thought I did, but I wasn't really sure. So I went straight to the source or as close as you can actually get to it these days. And that's the Carnegie Corporation of New York, which was founded by the famous industrialist. So believe it or not, they actually have a YouTube video addressing this point. And the answer is, it depends. If you're an American, you probably pronounce it Carnegie, and that's totally fine. But if you're from Carnegie's hometown in Scotland, you probably pronounce it Carnegie. And that's fine, too. Now, my own experience with this famous name comes from a Pittsburgh suburb that is named after him and that I used to visit annually for one of the world's biggest pinball tournaments. It stopped and doesn't exist anymore, but I sure do miss it. And I like going to Carnegie. And that's actually how the locals pronounced it. They used the Scottish pronunciation of Carnegie in the Pittsburgh suburb. Anyway, that brings us to this week's drink. Carnegie's influence was felt all over the country, but Pittsburgh was the place where it all started. Now, having grown up in the Northeast myself, my go-to drink for anything related to Pittsburgh would probably have been a frosty cold Iron City lager, aka the stuff that I could afford as a wayward teen. Anybody else who's grown up in Pennsylvania or the Northeast knows exactly what I'm talking about, but there's much more to Pittsburgh than beer. When it comes to cocktails, it doesn't get any more Pittsburgh than the fuss fungal. In fact, if you're not from there or haven't specifically gone looking for Pittsburgh origin cocktails, there's probably a pretty good chance that you've never even heard of it. Now, to be precise, this drink is actually not from Pittsburgh. It's from McKeesport, which is just a little ways east of the Iron City. But it definitely has the feel of Pittsburgh. The Fuss Fungal, which is basically a sweeter version of the old fashioned, is made with rye and brown sugar and molasses syrup and was reportedly invented by the mayor of McKeesport, back in the late 1800s. And so with this drink, we're not just capturing the location, we've also got the right era as well. And apparently back in the day, this thing had a real reputation. So according to a newspaper article from 1902, the fuss fungal drinker, and I quote, is ready to carry an election with it or to dance down the strongest set of legs in his social circle 
or to get up a strike, or to burn his house, or to do almost anything else that will express his high vitality and joy. The only trouble about it is the police will not always let him. So I'm going to trust that you're not going to burn down your house after trying this drink, but I do hope that it makes your game of Carnegie a little bit more festive. Fantastic, Chris. I love it. All right. Well, let's jump into some games that have been on our table. And uh, Adam, I'm going to start with you. You have been playing Envelopes of Cash. Tell us about that. That's right. The designer here, Andy Schwartz, reached out to us after a post on Twitter about, hey, you guys should try Envelopes of Cash. And I had heard about this game and I said, I'd love to try that. I I didn't know for sure that Andy Schwartz was the designer. And he said, you know, reach out to me. We had a little conversation. He's like, hey, guess what? I'm the designer of the game. If you want to get a a copy, I can send one your way. And I said, well, heck yeah, let's try it out. So here it is. Envelopes of Cash is the name of the game. Andy Schwartz is the designer. This was a prototype copy. The publisher is his publishing company, Envelopes of Cash, LLC. In this game, we're talking about theme. This game is one of the most thematic games I have ever played, and that's why I was incredibly interested in it. It's about, just a short little summary here, it's about bribing high school recruits to come to your college to play football for you. (laughs) So you act as a head coach, you're going around the United States, and you're trying to get these recruits to come to your school. Before we get into the game, I want to talk a little bit more about Andy Schwartz. He's an interesting person. When he's not sitting around designing board games, which I'm sure he wants to spend 90% of his time doing, he actually has to dabble in antitrust law. He's worked on tons of cases, and he's testified before Congress regarding antitrust issues and a lot of times for college sports. He's currently helping to launch a professional collegiate league. It's a pro college basketball league so that athletes can get paid while they're in school. Um, All this to say that Andy Schwartz is very familiar with the subject and he's passionate about it as well. The rule book is amazing. I'm going to read a little excerpt here because it's got some poignant stuff. There's a bunch of little poignant quips here from the rule book. One of the sections is called, is this game for real? So he goes in a little explanation. This is a real board game designed for people who love board games, not a political statement disguised as a game. Uh, We hope it's enjoyable, but we also hope it proves thought provoking. Uh, Above all, it's not just a game about sports. And he goes in to talk about how so many college athletes are a huge source of revenue for their schools. You look at any division one football program, that's quite often the main source of revenue for the college throughout the year. And these athletes go in, they, they really put some of their careers at stake and they don't get paid for any of it. So he is very passionate about getting these guys paid, getting them to be able to use their images, their names to make some money for sponsorship purposes. And he's had a lot of effect on laws in States, specifically in California. And anyway, I remember there was an old video game on Sega or whatever it was, PlayStation and college football game, you knew that these characters were the actual college football players, but they couldn't use their real names or anything and they didn't get paid for any of it. Uh, So I am happy to see that he's affecting change and getting these guys to be paid. Um, So that's my little rant there about what he's doing and college football in the United States. So what ends up happening to lure these college athletes? There is, there's a lot of this coaches or a lot of recruiting programs using under the table methods to get their athletes to come, whether it's cars or the classic envelope of cash or bling and all this stuff's kind of referenced. That's the different uh, colors of envelopes in the game represent all these different things, paying off family members, bills. That's another one of the envelopes. Anyway, it's fantastic. The game itself, um, he references Macau for just a small part of the game. There's this dice rolling mechanism where you can kind of go into Vegas so you can bet on what the dice roll is going to be. And if you hit, then you get a little extra income bonus. So that's kind of neat. But I've never played in a Captain Macau, so I can't speak to that. The game itself is fantastic and thematically makes sense. You start in different regions of the country as different head coaches. You're going around, you see the board with different athletes, different positions of a college football team in different states. And each of those costs a different amount of envelopes. You move your little bus, you're going on a bus around these different towns, trying to pick up these recruits. The game takes place over 12 months, over a year. You roll the dice, 
you can use that income in the future, in a future month, or you can take a portion of that income now and use it now if you want to now. So you can set up for, if you want to do stuff right now, you can set up if you want to do stuff in the future. So there's a little bit of short-term, long-term planning. There's a race around the board to get to these positional players. The actions you can do, they just make sense to me. You drive your bus around, you recruit a player. Also, the cards in this game are amazing. There's a draft of cards at the beginning of each round. And you select one, and it doesn't go into play right away. You have to earn envelopes to pay for these cards. I'm going to read some to you because they're just pretty hilarious. There's a card that says playing the angles. Take a, uh, a booster buck, they're called, if you crapped out in Vegas at the start of this month. How cool is that? So as the game is going on, there's a national pregame show on campus. So you know how like ESPN comes out and they'll have a little pregame show on your campus. Score an additional point each time you sign a recruit. So as the game goes on, you're paying for these cards, you're putting them out on your your tableau, you're really building a tableau and that'll kind of affect your strategy as to, do you want to recruit players from here? Are you going to go to Vegas more often and risk wagers? Are you going to try to sign players in this region of the country or this region of the country? So it just builds on itself. Very intuitive, very quick. Before we played the game tonight, I started getting into this. The flow was going, I was playing double handed and 45 minutes went by just like that. I looked up at the clock. I was like, Oh, I, better shut this down and turn the computer on and get ready to play Carnegie. I had tons of fun playing this game. It's envelopes of cash. I backed it because I loved it. I love the theme. I love the mechanics, the mechanisms. It's fun. It's just a fun time. The cards are hilarious. It's written with a little bit of cynicism and poignancy. And it's an issue that I think is important and that he's helping exploit and get exposure. So for all those reasons, I think this game is absolutely fantastic. Adam, you said you backed it. So is it up uh, on a Kickstarter right now? Or is there a late, a late pledge on it? It was on a Kickstarter. There's a limited run right now. At, after talking with Andy Schwartz, it sounds like there's about 500 total that they made. And there's about 100 or maybe less than that, even 50 or so less. If you're interested, he was hoping to get all of these out and in circulation and get them talked about and then maybe a follow on print run sometime in the future. All right. Cool. You guys have heard me talk about it before, but sports is just not a, it's not something that's interesting to me. I don't follow it. I don't, uh, I didn't grow up watching it. I, I don't care to watch it at all, but the way you describe the game sounds like a lot of fun and knowing that it was kind of, you know, modeled after a Feld style Euro game, you know, that's really cool. You know, they didn't try to take a, a modern theme and make a completely different game. They took a Euro, Euro mechanism set and then put a modern theme on it. And I think that's fun. I think it's worth trying. So I would give that a shot. It's cool. Yeah. And I got to say, holy cow, the theme of this thing. Talk about unique. I mean, I don't know if that's good or not, but it's very unique. I've never heard of anything quite like that. And one of the things that I, I enjoy about a unique theme like that, particularly in this kind of a circumstance, is that it's someone designing a game around something they know. I've mentioned this with board games that include some kind of cultural reference. I always want to get that cultural reference from somebody who actually knows the culture, somebody who's from that culture, because I think you get a more enriching experience. You're more likely to learn something. And I feel like this would be really interesting because it comes from somebody who knows that world. And that probably makes it a lot more interesting, a lot more thematic and a lot more educational. So, you know, so frequently we play games that don't have that going for them. And so I think that sounds Pretty, that sounds pretty delightful from a thematic element. One other thing that I noticed as I'm looking at the art on the box for this game on BGG, I don't know what this means, but it seems so deliberate that there are two pictures next to each other that are, as best I can tell, identical, where there's this kind of white haired guy with sunglasses holding an envelope of cash sitting in the stands watching a football game. But in one, he, you just see his hand that has the envelope of cash. And in the other, his other hand is holding what I'm confident is a Mai Tai. And I just wonder about that. That fascinates me. <laughs> uh, he knew you'd be looking at the rule book, maybe. Put the Mai Tai on there for you. Or, or is it a mojito? I don't know, Chris. But you're pretty confident in that. But yeah, you spoke to the, the theme. And I think that's part of what brings it home for me is it is such a unique theme. And he's tied this beautiful game to this amazing theme and this strange economic situation that exists here in the United States at the current moment, which uh, is just delightful. 
All right, cool. Well, thanks, Adam. So I'm going to talk about a game that I mentioned last week in the future take segment, and that's Slay the Spire, the board game. It had just gone up on Kickstarter last week. And I mentioned that I reached out to Gary Dwarsky, the designer, uh, to find out if they were going to have a mod available. And he got back to me just a few days later and said that they do have a mod up on TTS and it's available to the public. So if you want to try out Slay the Spire, the board game, you can go out on Tabletop Simulator and actually load it up. It's pretty nice mods, well scripted. It sets up easily for you. Pretty, pretty easy to run so i did get a chance to play this and i have to say it's pretty good i I liked it it's a very fun implementation it does a almost exact replica of playing the digital app and they do it well uh you know some of the random elements of the game are are handled well either with random decks of cards that you're drawing from or uh in some cases dice rolls especially like the effects some of the random effects of the monsters and so it's kind of neat you know like basically what's going to happen if you've ever played Slay the Spire the, uh, or the, the original, the app, the digital implementation, basically what it is, it's a deck builder. And so you would start out by, you know, with a with a very basic deck with a few defend cards and a few attack cards. And then you'll you'll go in and you'll face your first encounter as it'll be a monster. And the monster will be kind of weak, but basically you can play a hand, you can do a couple damage to it or do a block, and then they'll do their attack. And so each of these, you know, each of these cards, each of these encounters that you're going to have are the exact same creatures that you play in the app. And when you flip them over, they they act almost the exact same way. Some of them have a few different effects that may come up randomly. So with those, you roll a die. Whichever die roll you get, that's the effect that happens. Some of them, they always do the same thing every turn. So all you do is after you take your turn, then that card just does the same, you know, the same thing every time. And then some of them have a kind of a rotating effect, especially some of the like the kind of the mid-level bosses. They'll have a rotating effect where the first time you know they're going to do this attack, the second time they're going to do this attack, third time they're going to do this attack. So it just has a counter that moves down the card. So they they basically tried to recreate the exact experience that you get from playing the app into this physical board game. I think they did a great job of it. Now, I only played one time with one character. I didn't even make it to the top of the first uh, you know, kind of the first level. So I didn't even get to fight the first boss, but I got a chance to have several encounters. I got a chance to have some of the random uh, things. That, there's a, there are some different encounters you can hit while you're going through this map. You can go to a marketplace. You can turn, you can go to kind of a random, um, almost like a choose your own adventure thing where a story or thing will come up and you, you get a couple different choices to make. And so they have a random deck of cards that you flip over and give you those choices. So all of that feels very much like the base game. If you go on Board Game Geek right now, though, you'll also get a bunch of posts of people saying like, hey, well, the relics don't work as well here. Or the, you know, or these monsters are, are, you know, slightly you know more challenging than they were in the base game or whatever. So I didn't get that deep. I don't know how how exactly it compares to the game, but I can say that the feel of it feels exactly like playing Slay the Spire, the video game, you know, the game that this is based off of. So if that's what you're looking for, I'd say check this out. Um, I will tell you that I had a lot of fun with it, and I think this is a great style of game uh, as a solo player where I could have this set up and I can probably play through a scenario most of the time in 20 minutes. But if I'm having a really good run, it'll be a couple hours of gameplay there. But if it's only 20 minutes, that's okay because resetting it back up is going to be quick. I'll start over again and I'll get to do it again with some different random encounters and things like that. Super fun experience for me. Am I going to back it? I'm not going to back it. Um, it's like a hundred dollar game to start with. It won't be published for like two years. If I want to play the Slay the Spire, I've got a digital app to do it. I just got paperback adventures from Tim Fowers delivered to me this week that, you know, they were intentionally trying to recreate something that's like Slay the Spire. And that looks like a very similar experience. And I'm excited to dig into that. So I don't need to back this and hope that it comes in two years, but I will probably at some point, this is in retail and it's going for 50, 60 bucks on sale, or I find it at a, at a resale, you know, there's like 19,000 backers of it at this point or something like that. This will be available Uh, Someone will sell it secondhand. I'll probably pick this up because I had a lot of fun with it. I think there's a lot of fun game to explore in here. You know, it's not like the digital app where you can just sit there and just play three games in an hour. You know, there's a little bit more setup and stuff like that. And so it's something where I probably won't burn myself out on it, but it'll be one that I'll want to go back to frequently. So I really liked it. I think it's a great game. Does it need to exist with the digital version out there? Probably not, but it is kind of nice to get away from screens once in a while and be playing with physical components. And I think this does a good job of it. So I'm, I'm still excited, but I think it's great. I'm not going to back it, but we'll probably pick it up someday. Adam, have you played 
the digital app of this game? No, I never have. How about you? Yeah, I played it a little bit. I was kind of lukewarm on it. I mean, that wasn't bad. I just didn't love it. Sticking to Star Realms and Hero Realms. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah, I think, Chris, the, the the key with making with finding the fun in the deck building in this game is getting to the end of the, you know, of the spire, getting to the top of the spire, because at the beginning, you know, it's a lame deck, but and it just doesn't build as it's not, it doesn't build the same way it does in Star Realms, where you're basically having one encounter and building your deck over, over that encounter. Basically, after each encounter, you're usually adding one card to your deck or upgrading one card or whatever. And so by the end of the game, you've now replaced or updated or added like 30 cards and really built a unique deck and you're getting these big combos going by the time you get to the final boss. But up until then, especially in the early levels, if you played it over again for like 10, 15 games and didn't get too far into it, it, it probably gets grindy, right? It's kind of the same actions over and over again. It's the same encounters over and over again. And I totally get that. So I, I wonder if that's maybe why it didn't hit for you. But uh, I ended up playing it enough where I found some of the, the excitement of really building up a unique deck and playing with with unique combos of cards and how like rewarding it is when you get to one of these big bosses that you lost to the last 10 times in a row and you finally managed to put together the right deck and the right combo of cards where you pulled off a win with it. So yeah, I had a lot of fun with the digital version of it and I think I think it have I'd, I'd have some fun with the with the paper one too. Yeah, the thing I remember is that the art I disliked it so much that it like actually made me angry. <laughs> the art and the animation. I was like, I look at it and go, I just I want to punch my iPad. I'm not sure why that is. It's so weird, man. I I need to see a therapist. Yeah, so it's, it's almost got like kind of you know a hand drawn style where they have the animated characters and when they do a move, it's kind of like an old classic animated you know cell animation where it's just like one big movement instead of any kind of fluid movement so it really felt you know in a way amateur but i think intentionally like it's it's got a a style to it like that well if you didn't like the art in the game you wouldn't like the art in the the board game either because they use the exact same art the exact same graphic design the same colors like literally they it's like they just tried to reproduce what's on the app into the physical components so if you didn't like the art you're not gonna like the the board game art either fair enough well enjoyable art or not, I'm happy that uh, Gary Doreski is having a very successful project with this, and I'm excited to see what he comes up with next. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, I think that will wrap up this episode of Board Game Hot Takes. I do have one really nice review that came in this week on Apple Podcasts, and we always like to give a shout out to our fantastic listeners who are nice enough to take their time and leave some reviews for us. So if you're one of those fantastic listeners that enjoys this show, we'd love to read your review on the air as well. This week, it was Beta Chimp. Uh, He left a five-star review, and uh, the title was Good Buddies. They said, recently discovered this podcast and have been voraciously devouring it. The game reviews are great and provide me exactly the kind of information I need to help me decide if I will like a game. Thank you, Adam, for recommending Cafe and Tim for recommending Fantastic Factories. My family and I got into gaming over COVID, but now it's mostly just a me thing. And I've looked to you guys not only for the reviews, but also for your shared love of gaming, which is infectious. And I feel like I'm in the room with you during the podcast. I just listened to your Aquatica episode and it helped clear up some mysteries. For the longest time, I was struggling to figure out Jen's connection. Tim's sister-in-law, a family friend, a sister wife. (laughs) (laughs) That episode helped clear it up. Thank you. <laughs> so the episode he's referencing is we did our, our I think it was our one year anniversary episode. And basically we got, you know, the five of us that have that have been on this podcast, Adam, Chris and I, as well as Jen and Steve, who have both made some appearance on the show and, and joined us in the past. So all five of us got on and kind of gave our gaming history and gave a little bio and stuff like that. So I'm glad you finally discovered that. I often wondered when I have Jen on and I'll talk about like, oh yeah, you know, Jen and I played this like three times this week and oh yeah, me, Jen and Danielle are hanging out. I always wondered who, what people thought of our relationship. Yeah. Jen's just a friend in case you didn't catch that episode and were curious. uh, She's just a close friend, really good friends with my wife and spends a lot of time at our house, uh, her, her kids and her spend a lot of time with us. So anyway, glad that cleared up for you. Thank you so much for leaving the really nice review. Uh, I was, it was fun to hear that um you're getting some enjoyment on the show yes thank you beta chip until next week take care everybody good night all bye bye <laughs> i look at this whole thing and I'm like <laughs> <laughs> there's a thing there's definitely a thing